you lesson 10. And we got down to a capital D, part of kenosis. We've been talking about kenosis, to empty. And you're familiar with it, you just probably didn't know it was called that. And you say, well, why in the world we need to know kenosis? Well, you might read it in a book or something somewhere, a theology book, and that way you'll know what it is. Uh, the heart of kenosis, the false view is that some left some of his attributes in heaven. Now, if he'd have done that, he wouldn't have been God when he got down here. Now, the picture of that is found in John 13. You don't have to turn there, but John 13 is where Jesus rises from supper. He girds himself with a towel, and he washes the disciples' feet. He gets down on his hands and knees. He rises from supper. In other words, he's sitting in a chair. rises from supper. Well, that's what he did in heaven. He rises up, and he comes down here to this earth. When John 13, he shows them a picture of that. He rises from supper. He goes down to his knees and begins to walk, became a servant. Well, that's what Philippians chapter 2 said. He took on the form of a servant. That's what Jesus did. The picture of it's in John 13. Uh, so, he was as much God when he got down here as he ever was, and uh, he still is. Now, uh, Roman numeral 6 is impeccability. Now, we've already went over this, so you already know a little bit about it, so we're going to rush over it. Not that we're doing injustice to the, to the lesson, but you, you already, we've already had this discussion. Uh, anybody remember impeccability, peccability? Anybody remember that? Um, Christ, the impeccability of Christ is that Christ was not able to sin. He could not have sinned if He wanted to. Um, and, and the peccability, some people believe in the peccability. They believe that in the, in when, when Satan tempted Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, that he could have sinned if he wanted to. The impeccability is that he could not. See, folks, here's what you need to remember. The test. People, the people say this. Well, it wouldn't have been a test if he could not have sinned. That's not true. The test wasn't to prove that he wasn't seen uh, or, or, or would or wouldn't. Uh, what it was is, is to show us and to prove to us that he could not see him, That he's God. Uh, can God lie? I know he can't. He can't lie. Uh, let me read you this. Uh, let's see. Hebrews 4.15 for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. Uh, he could not have sinned. John 8, 29. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things which please him. Uh, and that's the key. He could not have sinned. Uh, let's see, Titus 1 and verse number 2. Now this is a good one to look at. Titus, right after Timothy, Titus. It's a good one to memorize. It's not a memory verse, but it's a good one to memorize if you want to memorize one. Verse 2 of chapter 1 of Titus. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie, Promised. Cannot. Notice. Cannot. He can't do it. Promised before the world began. Uh, he can't lie. Now, let's look at a uh, capital C. Good capital C. Answers. Look at 2 Peter. Keep turning right. 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 3. And let's see what we can get into right here. 2 Peter 1, verse 3. Well, we've got to read verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness 
through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And besides this, giving all diligence, adding to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, knowledge temperance, and temperance patience, patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. Notice, when you get saved, when you get saved, ask Jesus Christ to come in your heart and save you, whatever that was, you receive the divine, sinless nature of Christ. Now, if he could have sinned, if he could have sinned, you would not be receiving the divine, sinless nature of Christ. Amen. Now, I'm going to explain. Um, well, let me give you an example. There was a, uh, a poor lady. She scrummaged up enough money to buy a train ticket to where she wanted to go. She got on the train. They come around with supper. And they offered the lady supper. She said, no, I, I, I don't have the money. I don't have the money for supper. They said, ma'am, you don't understand. <coughs> supper comes with your ticket. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Good, yeah. When you got saved, right. supper comes with it. Yeah. You get all the promises. Now, you may not know that when, right after you get saved. You may not know, but you get a lot of additive things that come with it that sometimes we're still figuring out what we're getting. She thought that's all why she got the ticket. She got more than a ticket. She got more than a destination. Yeah, she's going to heaven. Sure. Jesus Christ bought and paid for the ticket. But on the trip, there's some benefits that come along with the ticket. Amen. Well, that's a blessing. Yeah. So when you get saved, you have the divine nature of God. Now, let me show you this, if I can. All right. Now, I by no means am an artist. And y'all are fixing to find that out. But I'm going to do the best that I can. All right? So, let's see. Somebody says, Noggin, don't. <laughs> 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 that ET or one? All right. <laughs> Y'all don't laugh now. That's the best I can do. Now, there you are. Uh, the, your, there's your body. The head and your body, right there. Now, Rick, what did you say? <laughs> All right. When you got saved, let's <coughs> see another color here. When you got saved, you received on the inside of you a new nature. Old things are passed away, all things have become new. So when you got saved, by the divine nature of God, He moved in. So you not only, you became, all right, before you say, one person. After you got saved, you became two people. This one here is the saved person that lives on the inside of you. That's what you're supposed to be acting like. That's what you're supposed to look like. But the outside is still the flesh. That's your body. Your flesh. <clears throat> See, when you got saved, you didn't turn perfect. Amen. 
your inside person, the divine nature of God that moved in is perfect. Amen. This outside, you say, oh, I still, I still have trouble with sin. I say, well, yes. I mean, we're not condoning it. But still, I, people pull out in front of me. I have trouble with it, folks. I'm saved. I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. But people pull out in front of me. Man, my flesh takes over. And my flesh don't act like the person that lives inside. Yeah, right. The key is, is for this is almost like the sermon Sunday when I had the little little, little baby stick man. This right here, <laughs> your flesh is supposed to act like the person on the inside. And uh, so when you got saved, the divine this is what you call two natures. This is your. Uh, Here's your old nature. And then here is your new nature. That's, that's you. Your two natures. Now, can my new man see? <coughs> can my old man still see? And he does. That's why I gotta get forgiveness. Amen. I gotta come to the altar and say, "Hey, Lord, forgive me." But when you sin, your new man don't sin. He's perfect. He can't sin. He can't sin. Just like Jesus could not sin in the wilderness temptation, can't do it. You better hope he can, because folks, if that saved person on the inside of you can sin. We're in trouble. <coughs> so you better hope you believe in the impeccability of Christ. Because that same impeccability moved in on inside of you when you got saved. Now, let me show you what I'm talking about. Let me show you how the Bible... Um, <coughs> Alright, watch this. Look at uh, 1 John. Look at 1 John. 1 John. You're at 2 Peter? Keep turning right. 1 John. John chapter 3 you got to see this 1st John chapter 3 verse number 9 look at it now 3 9 1st John whosoever is born of God okay are y'all born of God in here alright whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. Alright. Let's take a poll. I'm going to have my hand up first. How many of y'all have sinned this week? Amen. Now wait. That Bible says whoever's born of God can't sin. Now watch. Turn, look at... Um, Look at chapter 2. No, no, no. Look at chapter 1. Look at chapter 1, verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and His Word is not in us. Look at verse 1, chapter 2. My little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. In other words, hey, I don't want you to sin. But I, you're going to. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. It's sort of like a lawyer term. we got an advocate. Somebody to stand in for. 1 <coughs> John. Chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He's a picture of for our sins, not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Watch. 1 John, chapter 2, is talking about this guy. 
1 John chapter 3, verse 9 is talking about this guy. Does everybody see that? Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. There you are, right there. Does everybody see that? 1 John chapter 1 over there says, <coughs> Confess your sins. He's faithful and just forgives your sins. If you say you don't, you, you don't have any sin, you're a liar, and you don't even know the truth. Amen. Do you see where somebody could look at that and go, well, I'm confused. Yes. All right? It's the, nature, the two natures. You've got a saved person on the inside of you. Hey, have you ever wondered this? When the rapture takes place, you ever wondered why? That when the rapture takes place, over there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 1 Corinthians 15, it says that this old body must be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. Why does it have to be changed? Because it's flesh. Yeah. You can't go to heaven like you are right now. I can't go to heaven like I am right now. Boy, it's got to be changed. Now, um, I, I still... Every time you look over the crowd, you see it. You see an eyebrow like that. You, you know you still got a little work to do. And I'm still getting a few eyebrows. Now, oh, hallelujah! I didn't write this down, but hang on. I'm gonna bang. chapter 6. Right there on the same page. Good day. Romans 6, verse 6. Knowing this, that our what? Old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed. Where's your old man? That's right there. Out here, just what you're looking You're looking at the old man. That's why I wanna, when somebody pulls out in front of me, oh, I'm doing like this. <laughs> Y'all look at me and go, that preacher ain't acting saved. You're seeing the oh. old man. I have to reckon myself dead every day so the body, the body of sin be destroyed. Now, look at chapter 7. Verse 18. <coughs> Paul, this gets real confusing right here, but watch, stay with me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Amen. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Hey, Romans, uh, Romans 7, 18. This is what he said. Paul says, Man, I want to do right. Sometimes I don't do right. Because this old flesh just keeps a bugging me and bothering me. Watch verse 19. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. And it's not confusing. He said, I want to do good. But then my flesh don't want to do right. My flesh don't want to read the Bible. My flesh don't want to come to my plan. My flesh wants to stay home and watch TV. My flesh wants to watch Oprah. My flesh wants to watch Jerry Springer. My flesh wants to watch soap operas. My fl I think I'm preaching now, haven't I? My flesh, my flesh. I want to do it. But the evil, I don't want to do it. I wind up doing it. Verse 20. Now if I do that which I would not, it is no more than that that I do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. 
I find in a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Verse 22, watch it. For I delight in the law of God after the what? Amen. I want to cut off my legs and call me shorty. <laughs> I delight. Do you know what we are to strive to do? Delight in the law of God after the inward man. That's what I want to be. That's what I want to live after. I don't always do it. But that's what I want to. Now, I don't want you to leave here and go, well, Brother Jeremy, he says you can just say it anytime you want to because you, they say, oh, no, no, no. I didn't say that. I said you need to get your flesh crucified on the cross and live after the inward man like Paul said in Romans 7. He said, I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Why? Because Paul knew about these two guys. You're a split personality when you get saved. <laughs> you need to be in Bolivar. You're a split personality. Amen. <laughs> <coughs> that's what he's in. <laughs> all right, that's the two natures, real quick. All right, look at D. Results of impeccability. And we're not going to turn over there because I'm going I'm to rush over this. Matthew chapter four. That's the temptation of Jesus. The problem is not eating bread. Eating bread, turning stones into bread, is not sin. Eating bread is not sin. What is the sin? Disobeying God. That's the sin. Eve in the Garden of Eden. Is, there, is, is it sin to eat fruit? No. It's no sin to eat fruit. You can eat fruit. You ought to be, I ought to be eating fruit. I should have ate fruit instead of that coconut cake. Hallelujah. I may get another piece if there's any That's my flesh. <laughs> My inward man says, no, no. <laughs> My flesh is going, oh, yes. <laughs> That's the struggle that I have. That's the struggle you have every day. And uh, it all depends on which one of these guys you feed the most. If you feed this old flesh the most, then every time these two guys get into a fight, who's going to win? This old man over here. That's why you see some people claim to be saved. Some they may may be saved, they may not be saved. But some folks, man, I thought you got saved, you know, and they're living after the flesh. And uh, that man on the inside, a little bit like the little baby that I had on Sunday morning, a little bit. But he wants to be. He wants to grow inside of you and become uh, take over your body. So you'll live like a saved person does. Amen. Uh, anyway. <coughs> All right. Let's look at... Oh, let's see. Oh, yeah, let's look at this. Roman numeral 7. The work. Now, you remember the, the remember verses is, class, is divided into three classes. Humanity, deity, and the work. There's like six, Right? Two for humanity, yeah. two for deity, and two member verses for the work. What is the work of Christ? Well, it's the cross. That's the work of Christ. That's His work, the death of Christ. It's important. Without the death of Christ, there is no salvation. Amen. You cannot have salvation without the death of Christ. He had to die for the sins of the whole world. Had to. Or there would be no salvation. He had to shed blood. Uh, or there would be no salvation. Uh, look at uh, Luke 24 real quick. Luke 24. It talks about it in the Old Testament. About His death. Luke 24. Verse 23. All right, this is after the resurrection, by the way. Um, two men on the road to Emmaus. Verse, what did I say, 26, uh, 24. Uh, 
There we go. Uh, verse 26. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and, and to enter into His glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, He expounded unto them in all the Scripture the things concerning Himself. Notice. Now, here's... I mean, let me clear up something. And I know a bunch of... And some of those guys that are in here, and, and, and we know some, some of the big Bible teachers... Um, and I'm just going to have to say this. I mean, just because, I mean, they don't, they're not, they may not be right about everything. Amen. The gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection is found in the Old Testament. Yes. Isaiah 53 is a perfect example. He was a lamb led to slaughter. The gospel is back there. They may not have understood all the ramifications of it. They may not have understood all of it. But the gospel was back there. That's the proof verse right there. Mm -hmm. Jesus talking to two men on the road to mess. He takes them back to Moses and the prophets because they don't have the book of Luke. They don't have New Testament written. All they've got is the law and the prophets. Jesus takes the book of Moses and the prophets and He shows unto them all the things concerning Himself. How He was going to be led to slaughter. And a sheep done for his shear, so he opened not his mouth. So on and so forth. He was bruised for our iniquities. He was, uh, and so on and so forth. It's in the Old Testament. Uh, his death is mentioned in the New Testament. And there it is. Over 175 times in reference to Christ, the death. And this is what he come to do. He come to die for the sins of the world. Can you imagine being born and when you're born, that's what, I mean, you, your purpose in life is to come to die for the sins of the world. I mean, that's growing up. You know, okay, that's what I'm doing. When I get 33 and a half years old, I'm going to die at an at a age of 33 and a half years to, for the sins of the world. Now here's where I want to get to before we close. Oh, Ms. Carey, did you have a question? Was that when you became I mean, more human at that time? When he was on the cross? Um, was that the human part more? Well, I mean, I don't know if you'd say it was more human on the cross than any other time. Um, but no doubt, he, he never one time ceased to be God. Never ceased to be God. Uh, but there on the cross, uh, there was... He suffered. Yeah, that's true. A whole lot. All right. Here, let me, let me, let me, let's nail this to the wall real quick. The Gospel. Number four. The Gospel. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. And let's look at the Gospel. First Corinthians 15. Here's the Gospel. If you want to know what the Gospel is, here is the Gospel. And this clears up everything. Clears up everything. Everybody's got a different opinion about what the gospel is. Well, you got to do this, this, and this. You got to join this church. You got to get baptized here. It's got to be by this certain preacher, and it's got to be in the name of this. Or you can't. Or you, you wasn't baptized right. Or it's got. You can't baptize Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Where if you do, you do it. You know. Make me pull my hair out. <laughs> Real simple. It's real simple. The Bible's real simple. First Corinthians 15. Verse 1. Moreover, brethren, saved or lost people? Saved people. Because he calls them brothers. If you're saved in the room, you're my brother and sister in Christ. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the what? All right, so if we can tell you what the gospel is. Which I preached unto you, which also you received, and wherein you stand. By which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Now, watch this. Uh, some of you uh, it's already been through it. Notice in the book of 1 Corinthians, notice 
Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Amen. That's Old Testament. Right. And that He was buried, verse 4, and that He rose again the third day according to the what? Scriptures. Scripture. Okay, I'll ask you a question. What's the gospel? Death, burial, and resurrection. Let me ask you a question. Is baptism involved in that? No. Church membership involved in that? No. Turn over a new leaf. No. <clears throat> What's the gospel? The death, the burial, and the resurrection. That's the gospel. Plain and simple. Don't add nothing to it. Don't take nothing away from it. It's simple. Leave it alone. As it is, I declare unto you the gospel. Okay, Paul, what is it? Christ died for our sins according to Scripture. He was buried and He rose again the third day according to Scripture. That's what the gospel is. That's what will save you. That's what will save every person in Dyersburg, Tennessee. I don't care if the Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Church of God, Church of Jesus Christ, Assembly of God, whatever. I don't care what they are. I don't care what name you got over your door. If you go up, it's going to fall off. If you go down, it's going to burn off. It ain't over your door. It ain't going to help you none. Amen. We're Baptists around here. Hallelujah. But I don't even think all of them are saved. Amen. Amen. Being a Baptist don't save you. Amen. Being a Methodist don't save you. Being a Church of Christ don't save you. What saves you? The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. Putting your faith and trust in the Gospel Amen. will save any person. Amen. That's the key. And uh, all right, let me show you this real quick. Uh, hold, hold, hold your place. Hold, hold your hand right there. Look at Luke 4. Let me show you what the Bible will do. Luke 4 18. Real quick. 4 18. A King James Bible has a built in dictionary. I'm going to give you the definition of the gospel. And I'm not going to give you a Greek or a Hebrew definition. Uh, uh, the only Hebrew I know is a guy that owns a clothing store. <laughs> and the only Greek I know runs a pizza park. Um, <laughs> Miss Ellen didn't even laugh at that. <laughs> Luke 4, 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He hath anointed me to preach the what? The gospel. To the poor and so on and so forth. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, so on and so forth. Notice, anointed me to preach the what? Okay. Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61. Verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach what? What's the definition of gospel? What's good tidings? There you go. That's the definition. And it's wonderful. That's the way it does. Uh, look, look uh, if you're still... You, I, I got both of them pulled up here. Luke 4, 18 and, and Isaiah 61. Uh, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The Lord hath anointed me to preach the gospel, uh, or excuse me, good tidings unto the meek. Luke 4 18 says, Gospel unto the poor. What's the definition of poor? Me. me. Well, who's me? The poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to claim liberty to the captives. You see how you compare all that? Wonderful. That Bible is just 
amazing how it does that. <coughs> so if you got a preacher who stands up and says, well, you need to know Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic and all of that, you don't know as much as I do because I've been to school and blow that out your ear, get you a good Bible and compare, it'll give you, it'll, it'll give you anything you want to know. Did I just say blow it out your ear? Yes, you did. <laughs> Hallelujah. <Yeah. laughs> On the camera. That's on film. I wish I had known that when I was 14 <clears throat> and got baptized. I would have had years of full, of full film mm -hmm. instead of not knowing. Uh, you know, uh, our people is destroyed from a lack of knowledge. And that's, that's the key. So many deceived people uh, out the world. And just, uh, it's all in there. It's all in there. I, I do not have time to get into what I want to get into, but I will touch base with you just one second. Uh, those of you that go to church here, been coming on Wednesday night. Y'all remember that night we did Standing in State? Amen. Yeah. Um, I want to go into that next time we're together. Uh, like I said, next Tuesday we'll be going over there. And, but... but next time we're together, I want to do this standing in state. There is a difference in your standing in your state. And it goes back to this thing. There's a difference in relationship and fellowship. Relationship never changes. You can't change your relationship. Guess what? Your mom is your mom. Your daddy is your daddy. I don't care if they're not our divorce. It don't make any difference. The blood tells on you. Yeah. 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 My parents are divorced. That don't make no difference. Don't make a, a, a bit of difference. Wherever your daddy is, say, well, he lives in California. Well, you go to California, you prick his finger, it's going to tell on you. Amen. You can't change the relationship. Well, I don't want him to be my daddy. But it don't make no difference. You don't want him to be your daddy no more. <laughs> He's your daddy. His blood is running through your veins. You can't help it. Your mama is your mama. You cannot change relationship. Fellowship changes every day. Some days I'm closer to the Lord than others. It has nothing to do with relationship. It has to do with fellowship. Sometimes me and the Lord's real close. Sometimes I get away from Him. Am I the only one? Can't change it. Can change it. Okay? Your standing with Christ is here. Never changes. Your standing, and I'll go over this when we come back uh, next time. Your standing with Christ. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2 says, I'm seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus already. I'm already up there. That's my standing with Christ. It won't change. It cannot change. My state changes all the time. What state are you in? What's the state of your Christian condition? You're close to the Lord, not close to Him. Standing never changes. State changes all the time. Now, let me give you a uh, uh, an example of that before we go home. Picture this. Um, picture, I'm talking about muscles out there. Now, if I took my shirt off, I mean, they'd, they'd come out. <laughs> You'd be able to see them. Right now, the shirt, it's got them suppressed. <laughs> and we can bring Tyler up here, boy, he could really just, you know, Hulk Hogan this time. Remember, I'm talking about a, I'm talking about seven foot. I mean, cut up. <laughs> well, seven guys at the same time. Well, I mean, walk them at the same time. Come on, he walks them all. Say seven people at the same time. <coughs> he goes into beer joint and he starts drinking. He has the ability 
to whoop seven guys at the same time. His standing is that he can whoop seven guys at the same time. And he can do it every day or twice on Sunday. He drinks three, four, five. <laughs> <coughs> like Barney. <laughs> now he's leaned up against the wall. Whew, now he's then got his four, his fifth, sixth, and seventh one down. And he's about to pass out. Question. Does he have the ability? Now answer the question now. Does he have the ability to whoop seven guys? Yes, yeah. but he doesn't have the condition for it. His state that he's in, he can't walk nobody. <laughs> Same person. Your saved man can whoop anybody he wants to. But you feed that flesh and your state will not let you live the Christian life if you let your state affect your or, or, or your standing won't change. He can whoop seven guys. He can do it tomorrow, the next day, and the next day. But the state he's in, a lot of people, a lot of people, they, the state of their condition, their Christian life, is pitiful. Does everybody understand that? Now, don't get your state in a mess. Keep your state in church. Keep your state in the Bible. Keep studying. Keep in the Bible Institute. It's free. It don't cost you nothing. Stay with it. Stay with it. Your flesh will sometimes say, man, I just I ain't getting none of that class. That guy's crazy. <laughs> Stay with it. All right, any question, comment?